Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. I'm not sure that there's really going to be a specific theme to this podcast. Some of it will be a continuation of the last two weeks and sort of trying to find the positive in this crazy situation we're all going through right now. Some of it will just be random thoughts that I've had the last week. Maybe some tips or tricks that I can share with you. So the first thing I want to do is continue on a little bit in the theme of the last two podcasts. Interestingly, even though my theme was about trying to find the positive in all of this and to stay upbeat, I still got a number of negative comments. People that felt perhaps I was sugarcoating this or not taking this virus situation seriously. And I very much am. But as I said in those previous videos, I am not going to give in to doom and gloom and fear and anxiety and let that run my day. One of the things I used to teach when I would teach an influencing skills class was, and I think this came from Stephen Covey, but it was the circle of control, and then you have your circle of influence, and then your circle of concern. So your circle of concern is all the things that bother you. Circle of influence are things that you don't really have control over, but you might be able to influence the behavior of other people. And then there's what you can actually control. And the bigger the difference between that circle of concern and the circles of influence and control, the more stress you have in your life. And we don't need more stress in our lives right now. It's bad for our health mentally. It's bad for our health physically. So the best thing that we can do is manage those things that we can control. And the main things that we can control are what we say, how we act, and what we think. And my choice is to try to be positive in all three of those things right now. I think sometimes if you can be that person for someone else who's in an especially anxious place right now, it can be the thing that really changes their day. So that's kind of my mission. That doesn't mean that I'm downplaying the severity of any of this in terms of either the virus or the economic impact or the personal impact that it's having on many folks, my family included. So in the last podcast, I gave my list of top 10 potential positive outcomes from this current situation. And I got some great feedback too, some other people that saw some potential positives. One of the positives that a couple of commenters brought up was that they believe in the future, once we get through this, you will see a renewed focus on frugality and savings. I mean, this was something I think our grandparents were very in tune with. Perhaps they had gone through the Great Depression and knew then the value of having savings, having something to fall back on if suddenly things go sideways economically. So I think, I think that is a good thing. Another thing I think we might see more of if telecommuting turns out to be just as efficient as going to the office, I think maybe we see less people going off to their cubicle farm. I think this can be a good thing in that you are able to manage your sort of personal and work schedules a little bit better. Could potentially be a bit of a bad thing in that, at least for someone of my age group, that used to like seeing sort of the distinction between these are my work hours and these are my personal hours we may get into a situation where that becomes more blurred. I think that's something that millennials are kind of used to. It might be something that takes a little bit of getting used to for us you know, older folk. I do like the possibility though that you get a little bit of time off between meetings, your you know, web type meetings or Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever you're using, and you go outside, you go for a walk, or you do a little work in the garden, or you spend a little time with your kids or your pets or your wife or husband or partner. I think another potential positive in all of this, and it's strange the things that you think of, but less package stealing. So people that go and steal packages off of each other's porches because we're all at home. You're not gonna get away with that now. My package gets delivered, my doorbell rings, no chance to steal that. I also noticed yesterday when I was out in the yard with my grandson, how quiet it was. We live only a mile or two away from our local county airport. So I've kind of almost gotten immune to the sound of planes coming and going. And when it finally goes away and you don't hear those anymore, you realize how much of nature you start to hear. I'm also probably about two miles off of the interstate, and usually there's this steady drone of cars that you hear. And I don't really hear that. In fact, I don't even see that many cars driving around on my street or through my neighborhood anymore. 
And it's just, it's sort of cool. It's almost like going camping. You're, you're hearing the birds, you're hearing nature. It's pretty cool. I've got a lot of cardinals and woodpeckers in my neighborhood, I've noticed. I also see a lot more people out walking or running. Like, an unusually high amount. I feel that there are people that haven't exercised since 1998, and now they're going out because they were told to stay inside. And maybe they should be staying inside, because my YouTube viewership has really plummeted in the last couple of weeks. I thought it was going to go up. I thought people would be at home just binge-watching. Not so much. They must be out exercising. Hopefully they get tired of that soon and get back to watching YouTube. So if you have thought of any other positives out of all of this, no matter how silly, I'd love to hear them. Put them down in the comment section. Maybe it'll cheer up somebody's day. Now I think we're really going to get into the random thoughts territory. One of the things that I've noticed as I've been editing some of my videos is being very conscious or conscientious about editing out any time I touch my face. Anytime I touch my nose, uh, scratch my cheek, anything. It's kind of wild how hypersensitive anybody has even gotten to seeing these sort of things now. And it should be completely fine for me to touch my face because I have been in absolute isolation for the better part of two weeks. One interesting thing that I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of interesting things, interesting to me anyway, but this particular thing is for all of my life, I have suffered from pretty wicked seasonal allergies. So this time of year, I should be taking Claritin, my eyes are gonna be itchy, my nose is gonna be itchy, I'm gonna be having really, really lengthy, like six, seven sneeze, sneezing fits. I haven't had any of that this year. I've been on keto for a little over a year. I'm tempted to say that there's some sort of correlation going on between those. And that's good because I do still go out to the grocery store and Costco once a week just to stay stocked up. And I can only imagine if I had some sort of sneezing fit at one of those places, uh, security would probably be called and I would be escorted out by some people in hazmat suits. So. I'm thinking, yay keto? I'd be curious to know from those of you out there that have had seasonal allergies in the past, since going to keto, do you still suffer from them or has it gone away? That way we've got a bigger sample size than just me. Which, which leads me to another thought, and I'm sure there's not gonna be any data around this, but I think it would be absolutely fascinating to find out of the people that either get the virus and are asymptomatic or get the virus and recover immediately, or just have antibodies that keep them from getting the virus at all, what percentage of those people are doing keto? Again, I'm sure that is the last thing on anybody's mind in the medical community right now, but I think that sort of data, if you saw a strong correlation, that would be pretty amazing stuff. On the subject of the medical community, has anyone noticed that Dr. Oz is starting to look more and more like crazy Jack Nicholson from The Shining? Just me, maybe. I don't know. All right, I think that kind of gets us past the virus aspect of this podcast. So we're going to attempt to take a brief commercial break. I know sometimes these work for people, sometimes they don't. We'll see what happens. I'll be back in a second, regardless. I have gotten some interesting comments from a couple of the more recent videos that I've done. One is on sweeteners and the sweeteners that I use. It seems that no matter what sweetener I use, I'm going to wind up getting some sort of questioning, why are you using that? Or that's bad for you. Or that's too expensive. Or why aren't you using such and such? I can tell you that my personal favorite sweetener is Boca Sweet or bocha sweet. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. If someone actually knows, let me know and I'll start saying it the right way going forward. It's one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive, non-sugar sweetener. It doesn't cause me any sort of gastrointestinal distress. It behaves a lot like sugar. I like it. But for the last few videos, I've tried to dial back from it a little bit because it is expensive and I don't want to turn anyone off of a recipe thinking, oh, I need to use bocha sweet because Steve used Boca Sweet, and that's too expensive, and I'm not going to buy that. I also had a lot of people wondering why you're not using allulose more often. So I started using allulose more often, and then people wanted to know, how come you're using allulose so much? I kind of feel like I just can't win when it comes to sweeteners. 
So here's what I will tell you. Use whatever sweeteners you want. Some people love xylitol. Xylitol just wrecks me, you know, from like here on down. If it works for you, use it. Uh, although if you do have pets, I would say probably don't want to have xylitol in the house. It's deadly, especially to dogs. If you like Swerve, use Swerve. If you like Lacanto or Lacanto, whatever, however you pronounce that, go ahead. Use the sweetener that's right for you. I also believe that you need to know which sweeteners affect you. We can't actually measure our insulin. We can measure our blood glucose. We can measure our ketones. And as I've said in previous videos, I use a Keto Mojo daily. I do this just because as I'm trying out various recipes, first and foremost, I want to know, do they affect me? Because if a recipe affects me, if it knocks my blood glucose out of whack or kicks me out of keto, that's not a recipe that I feel I can share. And I believe everybody needs to own their own measurements. No does a particular sweetener affect them or not. So I'm gonna keep using different sweeteners. Don't get especially hung up on it. Use the sweetener that's right for you unless I explicitly state that this sweetener is the one you need to use for a recipe. Another comment that I got a whole bunch of and wasn't really expecting was when I did the sour cream lemon sherbet video, which I'll link to up here. In that video, I gave the measurements in both standard volume measurements and also metric in grams. And that really seemed to please a lot of people. Now, the reason I did it was because in the cookbook, Sugar Rush, Johnny Uzzini listed everything in both volume and weight. So I didn't have to do any calculations. And honestly, I'm kind of a lazy person when it comes to that. I don't want to be calculating grams versus, you know, tablespoons. But it received such a positive response that it may be something I do going forward. That said, I, I'm not sure that I'm gonna go back into all the recipes on the Serious Keto website and update them to grams. Who knows, maybe someday if I'm especially bored, I will. I will try to do weight measurements more frequently, especially if I feel that it impacts the recipe. That's as much as I'll promise you right now. Finally, I'm gonna close out this podcast with a couple of tips. And this first one, maybe a lot of you already knew this, I didn't know this. So for emojis in the comments, what I've been using is TubeBuddy, which is a content creator tool system. And there's some emojis in there. That's what I've been using. I didn't realize until I accidentally right clicked and I'm on a Windows system, but I right clicked in a comment field and saw that the first item on the list is emojis. And you can click that and then open up a little emoji window. Had no idea. Maybe everybody knows that, and I'm just the last one to find out. But if you've been wondering how people get emojis into their comments, that's how you do it on a Windows system. Another thing that I want to clue people into if you're looking to improve yourself or build up a skill during this stay-at-home period is Gale Online Training. I'm not sure what Gale stands for. It, it's G-A-L-E. It might be an acronym. I'm not sure. But what it is, is it's free online training in a number of different things. It can be languages, it can be crafts, it can be photography, computer skills from, for all different kinds of applications, project management, business skills. There is a ton of them. And these classes start up every six weeks. They drop one class every Wednesday and one on every Friday. You don't actually have to do them on Wednesday and Friday, but those are the days they come out. And I'm doing Photoshop right now. That's a skill that I would like to build up help out you know, with creating graphics for my website and things like that. If your local library is part of this education network, you can take these classes completely free. All you need to do is supply the number off your library card. If you get out onto Google or the search engine of your choice and type Gale, G-A-L-E, courses, and then your local city, you know, so whether that's Indianapolis or Seattle or Houston or whatever it is, and you'll probably wind up then seeing a hit on it. You want to look for a search result that points to a URL that's something like education.gale.com slash then the name of your local library, so St. Louis or Pittsburgh or whatever it is. Like any online training, it varies in quality, and sometimes they don't do a great job of keeping up to date on the apps. So for example, the Photoshop one that I'm taking was based on Photoshop 2016. 
so some things are in different places and I got to Google to find where that is. But still, it's free. You can learn a new skill. You can do it at home. So check it out. See what you think. Like I said, I'm taking Photoshop right now. In terms of other things I'm doing to keep myself busy at home, it's starting to get nice out. So I'm starting to work the vegetable garden a little bit. Got some lettuce planted, got some snap peas planted. Those should both be frost hardy enough that they should survive the next couple of weeks. Continuing to work a number of different recipes that I'm excited about, that I feel I'm close on, but not quite there yet, including a jicama chip that is pretty darn close to a potato chip, a nice crispy tortilla chip. I'm kind of struggling with some of the extracts though. I can't quite get the flavor dialed in, but that's coming soon. As well as some more recipes for fat bombs and stuff made out in the smoker. I've also gotten back into practicing guitar a little bit and starting to learn the ukulele. So that's how I'm trying to make the most of this time. Let me know down in the comments, what are you doing? What are you doing to have fun, better your life, better your house, better your relationships? That gives us all a chance to learn from one another and get some ideas on positive things that we can do during this time period. And that's it for this podcast. Thanks for watching or listening.